Hello, I'm Don Renfrew, and I'm going to be speaking about neurologic symptoms for the next hour or so. I'm a private practice radiologist with Radiology Associates of the Fox Valley. We're a private practice radiology group of over 30 radiologists that cover nine community hospitals in the uh, central uh, eastern portion of the state of Wisconsin, mostly around the uh, Fox River Valley. My practice is primarily in Door County Memorial Hospital, pictured on this slide, uh, and the uh, hospital is physically located where that red star is, sort of in the thumb of Wisconsin's mitten. Um, as I said, I'm a private practice radiologist, and I've been doing radiology for about 25 years. I was in academic radiology for a number of years where I did predominantly musculoskeletal radiology. Uh, what I have found uh, is that um, in my job as a general practice radiologist at Door County Memorial Hospital, there are several times where primary care physicians want to know what study to order for certain, radio or, uh, certain uh, clinical symptoms, particularly neurological symptoms, but other symptoms as well. Um, I'm, in addition to being the medical director of the Department of Radiology at North County Memorial Hospital, the director of Grand Rounds, where we have once a month a tumor conference or an interesting case conference. And in presenting material at these conferences, what I found was that primary care physicians often um, wanted to know what radiology s study to order for a particular symptom. Um, and they wanted to know that more than they wanted to know, for example, the physics of diagnostic imaging um, or a long differential diagnosis for imaging findings. Uh, therefore, I put together a set of lectures having to do with um, uh, clinical symptoms and how those relate to radiological studies. Um, now, one thing to note uh, on this slide of primary care practitioners, and again, this, this talk is for primary care practitioners, either primary uh, care physicians, such as family medicine physicians and internists, and to a certain extent, emergency room physicians, and really any physician kind of operating outside their area of primary expertise, orthopedic surgeon ordering chest x-rays, for example. Um, it's also for uh, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, anybody who orders uh, radiographic studies and wants to know, you know, which radiographic study to order for what symptom. Um, as you note in this slide, the number of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, medical school graduates going into family medicine has been decreasing, and this means that there's probably going to be more and more primary care done in the United States by nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, and I think this talk should be helpful to those people. It also should be helpful, however, to uh, uh, primary care physicians. Um, and again, if you're taking care of patients in the primary care setting, you're going to have many options for evaluation of neurological symptoms. At the same time, you want to order the right test the first time every time. You don't want to waste resources and time and energy and money and needlessly irradiate patients. Uh, and to accomplish those things, you really want to order the right test the first time every time. So I'm, going to, I'm here to try to help you do that. Again, um, if you've listened to my lectures before, you know that I'm a big believer in uh, what Cliff Atkinson has talked about in Beyond Bullet Points, and that is that uh, all of my talks are arranged so that the important material is on the red slides. If you remember anything three months or six months or a year from now, remember what's on the red slides. Uh, the rest of the material in the lecture is going to be arranged so that it supports uh, and under, underlines what I say uh, on the red slides. And I'm going to repeat what I say on the red slides two or three times at least to try to make sure that you remember uh, what the main important points that I believe are uh, in this talk. So I'm going to review imaging uh, neurological symptoms and uh, uh, imaging features uh, for potential stroke, for seizures, for multiple sclerosis, and for dementia. And I've got uh, more points than Cliff Atkinson usually says to make in one lecture. I'm going to have actually five separate points to make in this lecture. First, I want to note that neurologic symptoms need to be placed into one of several broad categories to plan imaging, and I'll go through how to make that uh, categorization. Second, I want to note that both transient ischemic attacks and stroke require an aggressive, timely management and workup. And I'll tell you what the uh, 
the workup is, and, um, and we'll go through that for both TIAs and strokes. Um, third, patients with suspected epilepsy really probably should be worked up by a specialist. Uh, and MR should be performed. Now, those are patients with epilepsy. First-time seizure patients usually come to the ER, and we'll talk about those as well. Uh, patients with possible multiple sclerosis should undergo MR as part of their evaluation. And finally, the fifth uh, point is patients with dementia should probably undergo MRI, although CT scan can be used instead, and it often is. So those are the five main points I want to make in this lecture. Um, now, the first of those points, again, is neurologic symptoms need to be placed into one of several broad categories to plan imaging. Um, now, you're going to see, as a primary care practitioner, many patients who have a neurological abnormality of some kind or some sort of neurological symptom. Um, some of these abnormalities may have an obvious and specific diagnosis. Uh, if you have an acutely hemorrhagic patient from a stroke or had a patient who just suffered a loss of consciousness and has tonic-clonic movements, uh, has a known diagnosis of epilepsy, uh, those patients uh, typically, you know, it'll be clear what's going on with them, and they're usually going to end up in an emergency room or in a hospital. Uh, their imaging will be pretty much what we're going to tell you to do here in a minute anyway. Uh, other clear-cut symptoms include patients with uh, likely abnormalities of the cranial nerves or those uh, central nervous system um, structures associated with cranial nerves. And I'm going to talk about cranial nerve abnormalities in a separate uh, lecture. Those uh, uh, cranial nerve symptoms include such things as anosmia or lack of ability to smell, either acute or chronic, double vision, uh, other visual symptoms such as vision loss or field cuts, hearing loss, and so forth. All those are cranial nerve symptoms. I'm going to talk about them in a separate talk. Um, how about syncope? Well, syncope is an abrupt transient loss of consciousness, and it's usually followed by complete recovery. Uh, and if it isn't followed by complete recovery, then you have to su suspect a stroke or something like that. Syncope usually is secondary to a vasovagal attack, and you don't need imaging, obviously, for a vasovagal attack. Um, other causes of syncope include uh, cardiac disease, especially bradyarrhythmias and tachyarrhythmias, um, and uh, there are many times where syncope remains unexplained. Neurologic disease actually accounts for very few cases of syncope. Um, and typically, evaluation of patients with syncope is going to use a non-imaging cardiologic test and neurologic tests are of low yield unless they're suspicious neurological symptoms. Um, now, patients with syncope after exertion or with angina really need to be seen by a cardiologist right away. Uh, patients with syncop syncope and dyspnea probably need to undergo CT angiography of the chest vessels to rule out a PE. Uh, and I'll discuss those symptoms in another chapter having to do with chest pain and shortness of breath. Uh, now, this is a 77-year-old woman with syncope uh, who did not have an obvious vasovagal attack but had syncope. And on the CT scan, there really isn't any abnormality. I'm putting the arrows on it because there's nothing to see. There's no abnormality on this. She did undergo an MR study. And here on the MR study, you see some vague increased signal in the temporal lobe on her right side. Um, on the comparison study of the two views, the CT um, in A and the MR in B, I've got an arrow where the abnormal signal is in her temporal lobe. This woman actually ended up having temporal lobe astrocytoma, uh, which is unusual, uh, but this is a case where MR was performed and did show an abnormality uh, in somebody with syncope. Um, now, when you're categorizing neurological symptoms excuse me, uh, with more subtle or fleeting uh, manifestations, unlike a, you know, like an obvious seizure or hemiparesis, uh, when, you're, when you're trying to figure out what, uh, what's going on with patients with transient or fleeting neurological symptoms, um, that can present a challenge. Um, there could be any one of a number of abnormalities that can underlie transient symptoms, including uh, TIAs and strokes, seizures, uh, migraine auras, uh, and I've discussed those uh, in the lecture on headache, um, and multiple sclerosis. Uh, there are some historical features which can help sort this out, including uh, whether the symptoms are positive or negative, and the progression and time course of the symptoms, and the duration of the symptoms. So, positive or negative symptoms. Um, examples of positive neurologic symptoms 
include things like seeing lights uh, or lines or shapes or hearing noises or having a burning sensation or paresthesias or experiencing a jerking or repetitive rhythmic movements. Positive symptoms like that indicate active discharge of central nervous system, central nervous system neurons and that kind of symptom can, uh, makes you suspicious for seizures or migraine or those positive symptoms. On the other hand, negative symptoms, negative neurologic symptoms include loss of an ability which may be something like loss of vision or hearing or cutaneous sensation or the loss of ability to move a body part and uh, that's a loss of neurologic function and if those symptoms are transient that suggests a possible TIA uh, or if it's fixed and long lasting could be a stroke uh, transient sensory deficits are the most common presentation of patients with multiple sclerosis. Uh, migraine auras will often start with positive symptoms and then they may progress to negative symptoms in the same modality. For example, paresthesias can uh, precede cutaneous numbness. Uh, now, how about progression and course of symptoms? Um, the positive neurological symptoms in a seizure typically uh, escalate pretty rapidly in a single modality like abnormal motion. Um, the negative neurologic symptoms of TI and stroke, uh, they'll typically progress pretty rapidly too in the negative direction. Uh, if you have initially positive and negative symptoms, um, like in a migraine, they'll sometimes slowly progress and switch from one to the other. Sometimes it can switch modalities like seeing bright lights to paresthesias. Um, symptoms of multiple sclerosis characteristically come and go and the catchphrase describing that disease is multiple lesions in time and space. Um, how about duration of symptoms? Duration of symptoms, so neurologic symptoms can last only a few seconds or they can be permanent. Uh, seizures are usually the shortest acting process. They can last for a few seconds up to a few minutes. Uh, TIAs uh, often last less than five minutes. Migraine auras typically last from 20 to 30 minutes. Multiple sclerosis attacks by definition last more than 24 hours. And strokes produce long-term and permanent neurologic deficits. So basically, uh, you know, those are the sort of different neurological features to keep in the back of your mind when you're trying to evaluate someone that comes in and um, has a neurologic finding. You know, you got the duration, you got the, the tempo, the, uh, you know, the progression, and whether they're positive or negative. And that'll get you sort of the broad ballpark of uh, what sort of disease processes you need to think about. Now, uh, we're going to talk about transient ischemic attacks and stroke. Both transient ischemic attacks and stroke require aggressive, timely management and workup. Uh, now, why is that? And, and again, you know, your clinical suspicion of a TIA and a stroke has to do with predominantly negative symptoms. Um, Short-lived for TIAs much of the time, uh, longer-lived if, if for stroke. Now, the term transient ischemic attack was originally defined as symptoms or signs of brain ischemia lasting less than 24 hours, but that definition's been modified because it's been recognized that the original supposition that neurological symptoms lasting less than 24 hours were not associated with brain infarction is false. In other words, patients that have symptoms for uh, 25 minutes or an hour or two hours that completely resolve, you can't really call those a TIA until you do all the imaging because they may actually have an, a, a true infarction that just has uh, transient symptoms associated with it. So now, uh, as, you know, what, what was, what's been found actually is that if you have ischemic symptoms that last longer in an, than an hour, many times that is associated with infarction, even with complete return to normal function. So TIAs are currently defined as a transient episode of neurologic dysfunction caused by ischemia without infarction. Uh, and typically the way you establish that without infarction part is with imaging. Um, now, even though they're, not, they're defined as not being associated with infarctions, TIA may still represent a, a harbinger of a significant stroke, just like you had the patient with a sentinel headache and subarachnoid hemorrhage, so, uh, uh, you know, two or three weeks after a severe headache, thunderclap headache, um, and a mild subarachnoid hemorrhage developed a ruptured aneurysm and died. And the same thing can happen with TIA patients. So TIA patients, they may end up developing a stroke uh, later on and that's something that you don't want to miss because potentially you could prevent that stroke with appropriate anticoagulation or other methods uh, such as urgent carotid endarterectomy. Um, 
So, uh, because of that, TIAs really require urgent workup and management, uh, either in the hospital or at least very closely monitored on an outpatient basis. Um, in an article by Johnson et al. referred to in this slide, you'll note that you, you can give patients points, um, sort of like the um, scale, the Wells criteria for pulmonary embolism. You give, give patients a number of points for their age, for their blood pressure, for clinical features, for duration of symptoms, and for diabetes. Um, and as you might suspect, you know, the, uh, the, the higher number of points are given for the more significant symptoms. And at the end of the day, this ends up being, you know, at least mildly predictive. I mean, you can, if you have less than three versus greater than six, you're going to have an eightfold difference in the likelihood of having stroke. Note that it's interesting that even if you have all these really bad risk factors, like say you're 70 and have elevated blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic, and have a speech disturbance and have a, an event that lasts a long time and have diabetes, interestingly, you're still, you know, not tremendously likely to have a stroke, but your two-day stroke risk is still pretty high. So, you know, it's necessary to facilitate the workup, especially with hyper uh, scores on the scale. Now, what are you trying to accomplish when you image somebody with a TIA? Uh, well, your goals are as noted on the slide, and um, basically, you want to exclude an intracranial hemorrhage. Um, usually, the intracranial hemorrhages are more typically accompanied by a fixed neurological deficit or a headache. Um, but you can, you can see intracranial hemorrhage in a TIA. You also want to evaluate for any possible alternative explanation for neurological symptoms like a brain tumor. Uh, you want to document any actual infarct accompanying the parent TIA and that would remove uh, the patient from the TIA category into the stroke category. And then finally you want to evaluate a, uh, the vascular tree for a source of the TIA including um, disease of the carotid bifurcations and the intracranial vasculature and the heart. So, um, in the emergent setting, you're usually using CT to exclude hemorrhage, um, but TIA patients, by definition, have no ongoing symptoms, so they should be able to undergo MR exam, which is probably a better test. Uh, it can be performed both without or with contrast, and it should include diffusion-weighted imaging sequences. Now, those diffusion-weighted imaging sequences will typically demonstrate cerebral infarction within minutes of, an, of the onset of the stroke, and they're typically positive hours before the T1 and T2-weighted sequences. Uh, for hemorrhage, an MR exam performed with gradient echo sequences is also uh, capable of detecting intracranial hemorrhage. Now, magnetic resonance imaging following a TIA uh, should in, uh, could include a, a magnetic resonance angiogram for the evaluation of the arch and carotid arteries. Uh, usually, you, this is done with contrast material, and you can use the same bolus of contrast material to study the arch and carotid arteries as you do to study the brain for uh, abnormal contrast enhancement, such as may be seen in an occult tumor. Um, and uh, imaging can include the circle of Willis. Circle of Willis imaging is usually done uh, on a flow-related basis without contrast, but you can do that with contrast too. Uh, kind of varies from place to place and so forth. Now, if your patient can't undergo an MR, maybe they've got an aneurysm clip, maybe they have a pacer, maybe they have retained foreign bodies in the orbit, um, you want to do a CT of the brain. You can do that without with contrast and CT angiography of the arch, carotid arteries, and gray vessels of the skull. And then basically you're looking for uh, any uh, intracranial abnormality to explain the TIA and any vascular source of a TIA. Um, you can also do ultrasound exam of the carotid arteries uh, to screen for carotid stenosis and ulceration and dissection and hematoma and aneurysms. Um, thoracic or transesophageal echocardiography, uh, the transesophageal is going to be more sensitive. That will evaluate cardiac sources of emboli causing TIAs. And I'm not going to really talk very much about echocardiography because I'm not a cardiologist and most of the echocardiography in the world is done by cardiologists at this point. This woman was 57 years old and she'd had uh, intermittent transient verbal difficulties. It was thought that she was probably having TIAs of some variety. Her axial T1 weighted image done without contrast shows a large lesion in the uh, left hemisphere. Here at the arrow you can see some bright signal on this unenhanced T1 weighted image uh, 
uh, pretty characteristic for acute or subacute hemorrhage. Here's a T2-weighted image showing the same lesion, a large lesion again in that hemisphere. And uh, the arrow here shows you the lesion and shows you that kind of crescent of blood uh, alongside the lesion. And then these arrows are in the adjacent uh, white matter, and this is basogenic edema caused by the tumor in the brain adjacent to the tumor. Uh, this is an axial T1-weighted MR with contrast. You can see intense contrast enhancement of this lesion uh, and the very um, kind of ugly cauliflower sort of appearance to the contrast enhanced exam. The arrows on this uh, slide mark that abnormal contrast enhancement. And this, this is a, uh, a composite of all four of those MRs done with the T1-weighted image done without contrast in A with contrast in B, the axial flare image in C, and then um, uh, the, other, the other image is actually a T2 star image showing abnormality from um, blood in this lesion. And this patient ended up having glioblastoma multiform and uh, died about two years after the diagnosis. She was, again, thought to be having TIAs at the time of her brain MR, and this was kind of a big surprise. This is one of the reasons, of course, you do brain MR on, pa on, on patients with TIAs is to make sure that you're not dealing with something else like a brain tumor. Uh, here's an 85-year-old woman with a transient episode of weakness about six days uh, um, prior to imaging. Um, the CT study was really pretty unremarkable. The axial T1-weighted image shown here and labeled B was also basically unremarkable. Uh, the axial flare or fluid attenuated inversion recovery image, which is sensitive to abnormal tissue, shows uh, a normal CSF signal intensity within the ventricles and in the sulci, but multiple scattered areas of white or abnormal signal in the white matter of both cerebral hemispheres. Now, are any of these anything to worry about? A lot of old people have these, and usually they're gliosis or scarring of the brain, typically from microangiopathic ischemic changes, chronic disease. Sometimes they can be secondary to vasculitis or uh, Lyme disease or even demyelinating disease. But uh, a lot of times you'll see many of these in old patients, and usually they're chronic. However, uh, the arrows here show these multiple lesions. However, in this patient, the diffusion weighted image um, shown here on slide 50, uh, shows a focal area of abnormal restricted perfusion adjacent to the ventricle. Uh, this image shows an arrow on that abnormal area. So this is an abnormality seen in a patient who had transient symptoms, transient weakness, six days prior to imaging. Uh, again, this is a composite picture of two images labeled C and D, one with an air, or both with arrows on the abnormal area of restricted diffusion. And again, you can see how the diffusion-weighted image, mark D, really helps you sort out what's acute and what's chronic in this patient because all the chronic stuff just kind of doesn't show any abnormal signal on the diffusion-weighted image. And this, was, uh, this is a case where a, a supposed TIA in a patient that had transient symptoms was actually indeed a, a stroke. Here's a case of a 74-year-old man with hypertension and a two-minute episode of dizziness and sweating. And his brain MR was actually normal, but because he was getting the TIA workup, he got the vascular tree workup as well. Uh, this was an arch and carotid MR angiography uh, performed um, after his episode had resolved and he came in for his workup. Uh, here's a blow-up of the same vascular tree, and this image has an arrow in the proximal right internal carotid artery, just distal to the bifurcation, where there's a tight stenosis of his proximal right internal carotid artery. Now that's not normal, um, and uh, the interesting thing is his intracranial vasculature was also not normal. Uh, this is his, uh, the source images from his magnetic resonance angiogram of his uh, circle of Willis, and you can see a great deal of asymmetry there along the uh, carotid siphon of his intracranial internal carotid arteries. This image shows an arrow where there isn't any uh, normal look and flow on the patient's right side, uh, where there is normal look and flow on the patient's left side. 
Uh, this is the circle of Willis uh, MR angiogram, and this is the same image uh, with an arrow to the abnormal area of the internal carotid artery, which showed basically absent flow. So this guy was a vasculopath. He had multiple vascular lesions, uh, despite the fact that he had a TIA but no stroke. So the, this guy had a TIA, he had, came in and got his imaging done, and he got an anticoagulant, obviously. And uh, I believe he underwent surgery as well for that carotid stenosis, but he's got a lot of vascular disease. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, it was uh, recognized uh, that he had this vascular disease because he had a TIA and he had the appropriate workup. Um, so, what are your goals in imaging the TIA? Again, uh, you want to exclude an intracranial hemorrhage. Um, you want to evaluate for uh, neurologic symptoms. You want to document an infarct, uh, and uh, you want to evaluate a source of the TIA. Um, if you if you document an infarct, you basically excluded a TIA, and the patient is now a stroke patient. So, those are your goals of imaging TIA. All right, how about imaging stroke? Well, you know, typically stroke patients are probably not going to end up in your office unless it's a very mild stroke or unless it's not recognized. They'll typically end up in an emergency room, particularly with a more severe stroke if they're hemiparetic uh, uh, and so forth, uh, or lose ability to speech and whatnot. Um, now, the, the critical decision regarding treatment of these patients is usually, um, you know, at least in the acute scenario, is whether to administer fibrillin fibrinolytic therapy as soon as possible. Uh, and at present, that means giving them recombinant tissue type plasminogen activator or TPA, also called Altapase, but I'll just call it TPA here. Um, so ER physicians and neurologists in stroke centers are usually going to make that decision and not the primary care doctor, but just to let you know what they're thinking about and what they're doing when that happens. Uh, they're looking um, at uh, multiple exclusion criteria when they decide to use that stuff. Uh, the patient has to have had a stroke, of course, in order to be able to benefit. And then uh, at the same time, um, you know, the, the duration of symptoms is usually less than four and a half hours. Uh, the, there's historical exclusion criteria, a lot of them actually, including stroke and head trauma in the last three months, a previous intracranial hemorrhage, major surgery in the prior 14 days. There's clinical exclusion criteria like a spontaneously clearing stroke, uh, minor or isolated neurological symptoms and persistent blood pressure elevation. Uh, there are laboratory exclusion criteria like platelets less than 100K, serum glucose less than 50, and INR more than 1.7. Then there's CT exclusion criteria. Every, all these people get worked up with imaging, of course, uh, emergently. So the CT inclusion criteria include evidence of hemorrhage or evidence of multilobar infarction with hypodensity hypo involving greater than 33% of the cerebral hemisphere. So in other words, if you have an intracranial hemorrhage, you're not going to get all the pace. If you've infarcted a huge area, you're not going to get all the pace because that's going to probably cause a hemorrhage and make things worse instead of better. When you come right down to it, given all these multiple exclusion criteria, there's a, you know, there are a few patients that are actually truly eligible for all the pace. Uh, for those that are, you have to weigh the increased chances of a complete recovery uh, which is about 38% with the altapase versus uh, in the chances of complete recovery with a placebo, which is 21%. So you got 38% versus 21% uh, complete recovery of altapase versus placebo. Against that, you're going to increase the likelihood of intracranial hemorrhage, which can be devastating by tenfold. So you can see why this is a controversial area and it's an area of ongoing evaluation and it's really a hard decision to, I think to make whether to put somebody on alta pace with, with the idea in mind you could help them, you could help them recover from their stroke but you may well cause an intracranial hemorrhage. Um, now if all that was controversial enough there's something even more controversial and that's intra-arterial alta pace. That is given to those patients that have uh, intra-arterial uh, lesions and or have uh, imaging findings that indicate that they probably have salvageable brain. Um, you, can, uh, you can give intravenous altapase as well um, past that four and a half hour cutoff if the right, in, in some centers they give that if the right imaging features are, are met. Now, uh, this gets a little bit into the weeds in terms of a detailed explanation, but 
basically, both CT and MR are capable of what's called perfusion-weighted imaging. That's different than diffusion-weighted imaging. The diffusion-weighted imaging are the MR sequences that allow you to figure out whether someone has an acute stroke or not because of restricted uh, diffusion. The perfusion-weighted images basically are going to distinguish infarcted, dead, non-recoverable brain from stunned brain. Now, if you do either CT or MR perfusion sequences, and it shows that all the brain that you can see on there is dead, uh, that it's completely infarcted, and there isn't any penumbra of stunned but recoverable brain, you probably won't be using either intra-arterial or intravenous uh, TPA. However, if you do those imaging sequences and you see a central core of dead brain or no dead brain and surrounding that or by itself stunned brain, then you're much more likely to promote the use of TPA even if it's five hours or six hours after the event because if it's stunned, it should be able to recover if you give the TPA. Similarly, if you, see, uh, if you do MR angiography or CT angiography and you see intraluminal thrombus, for example, in the middle cerebral artery, then you might want to seriously consider intra-arterial TPA to try to melt that clot. Uh, again, this is even more controversial than the intravenous TPA for all the clinical criteria, including less than four, four and a half hour stroke. So again, that's kind of a long explanation, but uh, basically uh, this is an area of ongoing research. Now, if, if your patient isn't a candidate for TPA, you still need to do CT because you have to know whether they've got an intracranial hemorrhage, because even if you're going to use standard anticoagulation, you need to know whether they have an intracranial hemorrhage. Um, and basically the same deal goes for the MR imaging. Um, if the patient's stable enough, MR without and with contrast is going to have advantages over CT, including a better evaluation of the vascular tree pretty quickly, uh, better evaluation for stroke versus TIA, and to a certain extent exclusion of tumors and other causes like that. And, uh, even though it's somewhat, it's somewhat easier to read a CT in terms of is there gross hemorrhage there or not, uh, MR is certainly capable of detecting hemorrhage with uh, gradient echo sequences. So basically when you have the patient come in and they have a, a, a stroke, you need to somehow or other get their brain image to see if they've got a hemorrhage uh, and if they've got any of those other things that could mimic a stroke like a tumor. And then you also have to do an arterial workup uh, and you can do either an MR angiogram of the arch and carotid circle of wellis or a CT angiogram of the arch and carotid circle of wellis or an ultrasound of the carotid arteries to detect for significant stenosis. And of course in all this too you're going to need to probably do an echocardiography to figure out whether there's uh, a cardiac source of the embolus. Okay, we're now at this clinical case of an 88 year old woman who woke up with left hemiparesis. And the reason I'm showing you this is this patient had a stroke not clear how long she's had it, but maybe she's only had it for a couple of hours. She woke up with a hemiparesis, brought to the ER, had the CT done. What's the CT show? Well, there's a large area in that temporal lobe that, where the uh, sulci are effaced and where there's decreased density compared to the other side, as seen with this arrow. Now here's a, little, a picture a little higher up. This is slide 72. This shows effacement of multiple sulci in the right temporal lobe. Um, even higher up, uh, there's a lot of swelling. You can see that the sylvian fissure is basically effaced on the side of the arrow, um, and you just have sort of an homogenous brain. Now, that, that brain might be normal in a 22-year-old or so, but in this 88-year-old who has all this atrophy on the contralateral side, it's not going to be normal. Um, and here is even a higher yet, uh, under the convexity at the level of the lateral ventricles, you can see hypodensity. Uh, through a large segment of the right um, cerebral hemisphere. Um, here's a composite picture of uh, four slices through her head, and this is basically the entire distribution of the middle cerebral artery, more than a third of the cerebral hemisphere, and this is a contraindication to TPA. Even if you knew that she had stroke in the last hour, if you see this kind of picture, you're not going to give these people TPA because they might hemorrhage uh, and go from bad to worse. Of course, she's not going to have a good prognosis anyway with this large infarction. Okay, here's a 76-year-old man who had acute dizziness, um, and this was a CT uh, with a prior comparison CT. Um, the prior comparison study is on 82408, and then we have a study from 9709. 
And is there an abnormality on the new CT? Well, uh, this arrow shows a very subtle hypodensity in the patient's left thalamus, which was actually prospectively called at the time of the CT. Here's uh, the CT exam with a brain MR, and you can see at that same area where there was hypodensity on the CT, there's a uh, area of bright signal on the MR. On this slide, which is the diffusion-related image, slide number 79, we see a focal area of increased signal in the right thalamus. Here it is with an arrow on it. And this was an area of restricted diffusion, classic for a small stroke. So this man with acute dizziness had a CT, which was very subtly abnormal, and then an MR that showed a stroke in the thalamus. Now here's this vascular tree, um, and the uh, arterial workup is vascular tree look pretty good. There's no carotid stenosis or ulceration or aneurysm or dissection. Um, however, the circle of Willis showed contralateral disease in his middle cerebral artery. So the guy did have uh, vascular abnormalities, um, but it was hard to trace them back to the appropriate arterial origin. Here's a picture of the circle of Willis with an arrow on the kind of segmental interruption there of the uh, middle cerebral artery. Um, now, as an alternative to stroke, here's a 48-year-old woman with unstudied gait, dizziness, and blurred vision. It was a little unclear exactly how long these symptoms have been going on, but it was felt that well, maybe she's having a stroke. Uh, this MR shows quite a bit of abnormal signal in the cerebellum, and this sagittal MR uh, with some arrows on it shows you, again, that abnormal signal in A in her cerebellar hemisphere, and then B, a little bit more normal appearance on the contralateral side. Uh, and this patient actually uh, ended up with a diagnosis of viral cerebralitis. So there are alternative diagnoses to strokes that you can see on imaging, and that's one of the reasons you do the imaging, not only to document the stroke, but also to exclude alternative diagnoses. So that ends our talk of TIAs and strokes, and again, those people need facilitated workup now, sooner rather than later. Uh, you got to move right along on that, and you have to see what their vascular tree is doing, whether they have significant stenosis. I will talk in another lecture on uh, angiographic workup and vas the vascular tree in, in more detail, um, but uh, that gives you an idea of, in general, the kind of images and studies you need to order in patients with suspected uh, stroke or TIA. How about epilepsy? Well, basically, you know, if you really think somebody's got epilepsy, you need to send them to a specialist because um, those patients are going to be on lifelong medication and they do need to have an MR, and I'll talk about that in a second. For uh, a patient with a single stroke, um, it's should be noted that uh, seizures, especially the initial seizure, that could be the result of a reversible medical disorder, or it could be the result of the first time uh, that somebody with epilepsy had a seizure. And there's a lot of medical disorders that can provoke seizures, and those include things like hypoglycemia, non-catonic hyperglycemia, rapid falls in serum sodium concentration, hypocalcemia, renal failure and uremia, hyperthyroidism, intermittent porphyria, cerebral anoxia, like carbon monoxide poisoning, drowning, which you're going to know about, uh, drug toxicity and withdrawal, which may be a little more, uh, you know, the patients may a little be, be a little less forthcoming in, with that history. And your initial testing needs to be directed toward excluding those medical disorders. And in the acute setting of the first seizure, you're usually going to get a head CT, and that's often going to be done through the ER. You're looking mainly for intracranial hemorrhage or brain abscess or tumor, or things like that. This 65-year-old had a nuanced seizure, was not known to have primary cancer but uh, came into the emergency room and on the CT scan was shown to have a large tumor in his right frontal lobe. Um, this 60-year-old anticoagulated patient had nuance seizures and the MR here shows uh, increased signal or uh, kind of a white line along her left hemisphere uh, here marked with the arrows. Um, here's an axial flare, again, abnormal increased signal along the temporal lobe there. And this patient had a subdural hematoma. Uh, 
as a, an accompaniment to her new seizures. Whether that was causative or not, a little hard to tell because she had some other things going on, but uh, the MR sure, certainly showed a, uh, an abnormality, a striking abnormality in this patient with a new seizure. So if you assume then that the medical disorders have been excluded and epilepsy remains your likely diagnosis, then usually as a primary care doctor, you're gonna, or primary care provider, you're gonna refer that patient on to a neurologist or an epilepsy specialist. And that's because epilepsy is pretty rare. Uh, the diagnosis has a significant impact and the treatment's gonna be lifelong. Uh, the goal that those people are gonna have is to try to figure out whether there's a structural cause of epilepsy, especially when you can't control the epilepsy with medication and you think that there might be a surgical intervention that would help the patient. Now your structural causes of epilepsy include hippocampal sclerosis, uh, brain tumors, dysplasia, and vascular malformations. Um, now do you get those at one and a half Tesla or a three Tesla magnet? In other words, almost all the uh, uh, magnets out there, well most of the magnets out there right now are one and a half Tesla. And they're great machines and they're widespread and ubiquitous. There are a few three Tesla magnets out there. You'll see those mostly in university settings and in larger uh, hospitals. Uh, and, some, and usually they'll be both one and a half and three Tesla if, if people have three Tesla magnets. Um, there's, there was a lot of hoopla about three Tesla initially because usually, you know, higher fill strength was better up until the point where you got the one and a half T. As it turns out, going to three T doesn't offer uniform advantages necessarily in all cases, but in this particular case, it probably does offer some pretty big advantages. Um, the Kanaki article cited first here, they showed that imaging performed on a, a 3T versus a 1.5T magnet depicted causative lesions with much greater sensitivity and accuracy. In a subgroup of 23 of their patients with a normal interpret 1.5T, there were new lesions detected in 15 or 63% of those. In the other study here, uh, Fall et al. found that epilepsy imaging performed at 3T showed increased image quality and detected more structural lesions and improved characterizations of the lesions compared to 1.5T. Um, and while, it, so, while a 1.5T can be diagnosis in some, diagnostic in some cases, it's not possible to predict which cases are going to be falsely negative or equivocal. And so since you're going to have to re-image anybody that you do at 1.5T at 3T in negative or equivocal cases, um, you know, maybe if you found a huge brain tumor, you wouldn't, but otherwise, you're not going to know for sure what's going on until you do it at 3T. So it's usually better to perform the imaging from the get-go with a 3T at an epilepsy center where they really deal with this kind of issue all the time. Um, so that, that's the story on epilepsy. You know, you want to image it, and you probably need to image it with 3T. At the same time, as a primary care provider, you're probably going to refer most of those patients. Um, how about multiple sclerosis? Well, patients with multiple sclerosis or who you think have multiple sclerosis should probably undergo MR. Um, what is multiple sclerosis? Uh, well, it's a demyelinating, idiopathic demyelinating disease. It's not really quite sure uh, what, it, uh, you know, what it is. It might be idiop uh, an autoimmune phenomenon of attacking, the body attacking its own myelin. Um, now, even though the hallmark of multiple sclerosis is multiple lesions in time and space or multiple lo locations, uh, in neurologic locations, most patients, or about 85%, are going to initially present with a clinically isolated syndrome. And that clinically isolated syndrome is usually either uh, 40 to 50% of the time a transient sensory or motor deficit, um, about 15 or 20% of the time a mono monocular vision loss or, uh, or visual field loss from an optic neuritis, uh, maybe about 7% of the time diplopia, and then down around 5% of the time it's going to be balance problems or vertigo. Uh, so you have a, you know, a number of clinically isolated syn syndromes that should make you think, especially in younger people, of the possibility of multiple sclerosis. Um, now those patients therefore with clinically isolated syndrome should undergo a contrast enhanced MR study. Uh, at one point, MS was uh, the, that diagnosis was confirmed using what they called a, what was called a poser criteria, and that required uh, two clinical episodes. Uh, nowadays, waiting for the, sep the second episode is not really acceptable because there's disease modifying criteria, and therefore the McDonald criteria are used instead of the uh, poser criteria. What are the McDonald criteria? Well, the McDonald criteria allow a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. 
uh, with one clinical attack and either abnormal CSF uh, with oligoclonal bands or an abnormal MR. Now the abnormal MR has to have several of, uh, different abnormalities on it usually, uh, or at least one striking abnormality. So you've got to have three out, of the three out of the four of these. You need one gadolinium enhancing or nine, two, nine T2 hyperintense lesions if there aren't any gadolinium enhancing lesions. You need one or more infratentorial lesions, you need one or more juxtacortical lesions, and three or more periventricular lesions. And again, you need three out of those four uh, sets of abnormalities. So you really have to have quite a few abnormalities to make the diagnosis on MR. Uh, and you also, that needs to go with a typical clinical attack. Um, so, uh, the MR criteria then, in the, well, these McDonald criteria kind of underline what the features of MR, the, the MR features of multiple sclerosis are. And those include multiple areas of abnormal bright increased signal on T2-weighted images. Uh, sometimes they'll show matched decrease signal on the T1 weighted images. Sometimes those areas will show contrast enhancement. Uh, and you got to remember that none of these are specific findings. You can see the same imaging features in all kinds of other diseases, including acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, vasculitis, Lyme disease, and migraine headache. Um, systemic lupus erythematosus, you may not only demonstrate similar lesions of MR, but occasionally those patients present with recurrent neurologic symptoms prior to systemic magnification, mag uh, manifestations of the disease. So if you have a patient with SLE without the rash and without the other systemic manifestations, it can be very confusing because those patients will really look a lot like they have MS. Um, now, patients with MS can be followed with serial MRM exams and that's going to document progression or regression. Uh, enhancing lesions indicate breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. That's kind of taken as a proxy for inflammation and disease activities. There are several maneuvers that can uh, document additional contrast enhancing lesions compared to your standard technique. And those include uh, magnetization transfer pulse sequences and triple dose contrast and delayed imaging. But these techniques are not really routinely required and they're not incorporated into the uh, MS diagnostic criteria. Um, here's a 40 one-year-old woman who had numbness in both hands and double vision. So here she's got a couple of different symptoms making you think, well, something's going on, especially in this 41-year-old. In this uh, axial flare sequence, there's some areas of abnormal T2 prolongation and bright signal in the white matter but in both hemispheres marked here with the arrows on slide 109. Uh, in this woman, her sagittal MR showed a lot of increased, act, uh, increased signal in the uh, corpus callosum and in the white matter close to the corpus callosum here marked with a couple of arrows. And here's a composite picture of uh, axial uh, flare images and sagittal flare image showing multiple areas of abnormal signal in the white matter in this patient with multiple sclerosis and uh, uh, numbness in the hands and double vision. So that's multiple sclerosis, again, um, diagnosed with the McDonald criteria nowadays. Um, think about it with a clinically isolated syndrome in a younger patient and uh, needs MR without with contrast. Okay, the final topic I'll talk about is dementia. Uh, patients with dementia should undergo MR. You know, you can substitute CT, but MR is probably a little bit better test. It can show you a little bit more what's going on. Um, now, what is dementia? Well, the fourth edition of the DSM-4, or the, or the so-called DSM-4, the American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, that defines dementia as a disorder characterized by impairment of memory and at least one other cognitive domain, aphasia, apraxia, agnosia, or executive function. And that re represents a decline from a prior level of function severe enough to interfere with daily function and independence. Um, fortunately, Self-reported memory loss doesn't appear to correlate with development of dementia, while spouse or other informant reported memory loss is much better as an indicator of either present or future development of dementia. And the diagnosis usually rests on a clinical history, and then you supplement that by cognitive tests like the mini mental status exam or the clinical, clinical dementia rating or the mini cog test or even formal neurological or neuropsychological testing. And that's how you get your diagnosis of dementia. Now, dementia syndromes come in a couple of different flavors, there, but most of the time it's going to be Alzheimer's disease, uh, 
Um, normal pressure hydrocephalus may also be associated with dementia, uh, and that usually shows also gait disturbance and in urinary incontinence. And it's characterized by pathologically enlarged ventricles uh, with a normal opening pressure on a lumbar puncture. Here is this 78-year-old man who had dementia, incontinence, and gait abnormality, and you can notice his lateral ventricles are disproportionately enlarged to his sulci. This slide shows an arrow on his left lateral ventricle. Um, you can see the, uh, this slide shows an arrow on the left lateral ventricle and another arrow on his sulci, which are not nearly as distended as his ventricles, and he had normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, you can confirm that diagnosis usually with a clinical response to removal of 50 cc's or so of cerebrospinal fluid, but there seems to be little consensus regarding the diagnosis or the selection of patients for possible therapeutic shunt placement. Uh, shunts do help some of these patients quite well. So what are you doing the imaging for in the first place? Well, you've got the dementia syndrome, you're trying to exclude subdural hematoma and these other processes. Uh, the American Association of Neurology recommends either a CT or MR uh, in the routine initial evaluations of all patients with dementia. And MR can accomplish ex the goals of excluding a subdural hematoma, of excluding a cerebral neoplasm, uh, evaluating for disproportionate dis distension of the lateral ventricles relative to the sulci, like the case we just saw. Uh, and if you see that abnormal disproportion, you think normal pressure hydrocephalus. You can also look for uh, disproportionate frontal lobe atrophy, which would suggest frontotemporal dementia, and you can evaluate for multiple prior strokes, suggesting vascular dementia. Um, it should be noted that most of your MR studies are going to show nonspecific generalized atrophy, since that's the most common finding in Alzheimer's disease, and Alzheimer's disease accounts for the majority of dementias. Uh, while MR may also allow hippocampal volume measurements in Alzheimer's disease, it's not clear whether that adds much to the clinical diagnosis. Um, finally, additional imaging could be done with FTG PET or PET scanning. Um, that may distinguish Alzheimer's disease from frontotemporal dementia, but outside the research setting, there's not a lot of therapeutic imperative to make that distinction. Um, here's an 86-year-old man with dementia who has bilateral large ventricles and pretty prominent sulci. Here's arrows on the frontal horns of his uh, lateral ventricles, which are distended. Um, here's an image a little further down at the level of the lateral ventricles. And this arrow shows a stroke there on the uh, patient's right side. And this is another area in the right hemisphere where there was an additional stroke. And this man actually had multi-infarct dementia. So the imaging can kind of sort out whether they have a brain tumor or subdural hematoma, some Un, uh, sort of unusual or unsuspected cause of their dementia and can sometimes kind of categorize their dementia into one of the several types that, it's, uh, that are possible. So I've taken up about an hour of your time reviewing imaging of neurological symptoms and stroke, seizures, MS, and dementia. And again, to review, uh, neurologic symptoms should be placed into one of several broad categories to kind of plan imaging. Do you think the patient more likely has a TIA or a stroke? Are they migraine auras and do they even need imaging in that case? Um, does it represent a clinically isolated syndrome in a young person? In which case you should think of MR without or with contrast. So you know what category do the symptoms belong in? Um, we've talked about the fact that both transient ischemic attacks and stroke require an aggressive, timely management and workup because you need to know whether those patients are actually having a stroke or have some alternative diagnosis. And if they're having a stroke, you need to evaluate their vascular treatment in a timely fashion uh, to know whether they need uh, to have a carotid stenosis, for example, operated on. Um, patients with suspected epilepsy, you know, the first time seizures, you've got to kind of exclude the metabolic stuff and the uh, and the brain tumors and whatnot, but after you've done that, uh, typically those patients will go off to uh, a specialist. And at least for the epilepsy, formal epilepsy workup, uh, where they need to be imaged for possible brain lesions which will undergo surgery, um, a 3T magnet is, is helpful. Um, patients with multiple sclerosis, uh, clinically isolated syndrome, again, is going to be one of their main things, and there's McDonald criteria to follow, and you need to uh, put those patients through an MR with and without contrast material. And finally, patients with dementia, you need to image them sometime with their initial workup. CT or MR both work okay, MR is probably a little better.
Thank you for your time today.